For those of you who don't remember, um, last week, I, or not last week, about five or six weeks ago, I actually did a beginning half of my sermon that was way, way too long, so I decided to cut it into two sermons. Only problem is you had to remember what I said five or six weeks ago. I am going to give you a quick little review, uh, review of it, but it's passing our faith on to the next generation. I spoke about Hannah's faith, how she raised Samuel to be a man of God, that he grew to be a faithful servant of God, and a lot of that was because of the commitment and dedication of Hannah. But then we also did that in comparison to Eli, who was the priest, and Eli in his failure as a father to raise his two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, because he failed miserably when it came to be a dad. I also shared with you a study that was done by the Barna Group in 2020 that talked about millennials. This one was specifically related to millennials. And it asked them how many had a biblical worldview. Now, if you recall, biblical worldview had six questions or six statements that they said. And if you agreed with these six statements, then you were considered to have a biblical worldview. Well, if you read these, these are really very basic simple truths that I can't imagine anyone who proclaims to be a Christian would not agree with. Unfortunately, it came up that only 2% of millennials actually were considered to have a biblical world view. That's sad. That's a very sad thing about our world. And while 2% is a pretty dismal amount, it wasn't much better in other generations. Because if we went on and looked at Gen Xers, who were aged 37 to 55%, it was 5%. The baby boomers and boomers and older, who are supposed to be, you know, really the strong faithful ones, only 9% have a biblical worldview. And in a different study, one of the things that really concerned me a lot was that 18 to 23-year-olds, less than one half of 1% had a biblical worldview. That's scary. And it is something that worries me, and it's a sad reflection on our society and on people's commitment to God. And it often helps me understand why the verse in Matthew 7, 13 says that the gate is narrow, and there are going to be few that enter into it. That's a statement that scares me a lot, because I want this whole world to go. I know God wants this whole world to go, but unfortunately, it isn't. Because the way is narrow and few there are that are going to enter. So now, here's the rest of the story. I'm glad the youth aren't here because most of them would not know who Paul Harvey was and wouldn't even understand the rest of the story anyway. So, last time we looked at the statistics, but today I'm actually going to go through and talk about a lot of practical ideas for passing our faith on to the next generation. How do we actively pass on our faith to God's children of, of the future? And to do it in God's design. Now, I'm going to put something up here. This is my email. I'm going to have different websites. I'm going to have different statements, things like this. If anybody wants any of this information, feel free to email me, and I'll be able to send you everything that you'd like to have. If you don't have a chance to write it down here or anything, it is in the directory, so you can find it. But the verses we talked about that we're going to be using today is from Ephesians 6, 4. There were a whole lot of other verses that I could have used. But this is a nice, simple, succinct one that says a whole lot about raising our children. As it was read, it says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Dads, I'm going to put to you that God has given each of us the responsibility for raising our children. It says, fathers, raise them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now, I'm going to use some other verses. I'm going to go to the Old Testament. Because I'm going to put dads on the spot today. Because I think we need to be put on the spot. If you look, go to Psalm 78, 1 through 7, it says, Give, give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in parable. I will utter sayings for dark sayings from of old. Things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. 
We will not hide them from their children, but tell them to the coming generations the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and his wonders that he has done. He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach their children, that the next generation might know them. The children yet unborn and arise to tell them to their children so that they should, be, should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. If you go and look at Proverbs 4, 1 and 2, if you look at this chapter, the whole chapter is about wisdom and instruction from dads. But verse 1 and 2 says, Hear, O sons, a father's instruction, and be attentive that you may gain insight. For I give you good precepts, do not forsake my teaching. Now moms, I'm going to tell you, don't think you aren't important. Because if there is a time where the father cannot fulfill the role or won't fulfill the role, there are examples of mothers and grandmothers in scripture that also go on to teach their children. If we don't know a whole lot about Timothy's father, uh, we do know that he was a Greek, and we know that in Acts 16, verse 1 and 3, that his mother was a Jewish. But he had not been circumcised, probably because of his dad's refusal to allow it to happen, because he was not a member of the faith. But Paul, te- I mean, Paul speaks of Timothy's, Timothy's mother and father, I mean, his mother and his grandmother, of Eunice and his wife Lois, and his mother Lois. Get all these things together. Um, because he actually went on and passed their, they passed their faith on to him. So mothers are equally important. So, as we continue to go on, click this. One of the things that I would put to you that whatever it is that you decide to do, do something. Dads, unfortunately, moms a lot of times are the ones who are the passer on of our faith. And they should be full support of the dads. But it is the dad's role to raise children in a faith. Moms, you need to be there for every step of the way, and it's a whole lot better when you have a team that's working together. But the thing is, do something. Pick an idea. Hold yourself accountable for it. If it isn't a fit or something your kids cling to, do something else. The point is to stay active in bringing up the faith of your children. Parents, I'm going to tell you something. Once your child is conceived, it is a forever soul. Think on that. It isn't an 18-year journey that you have to raise these children. That is a forever soul. Janet and I have four kids. Two I got to enjoy in this earth. Two... Excuse me. I'll meet in heaven. Don't know why I went into that. I should have stopped. should have left that line out of there. Sorry. But as I mentioned today, we're going to go into a lot of faith-building things for our kids. The first idea that I'm going to go into is, direct, is directly adapted from Scripture. Look at Deuteronomy 6, 5 through 9. It says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house. And when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Well, I tell you what, there's a lot said there. If you have elementary kids, my goodness, sit down with them and have them design your own family crest for God. Let them have input on what they think is important about your family and when it comes to serving God. God said, do it under the old covenant? I think it probably would be applicable for today. As a family, let these kids make faith bracelets or signs for the doorpost or anything like that. Kids love crafts and arts projects. Janet, when we built our home 18 years ago, she built in a Sunday school closet. We have a whole closet that has unbelievably untold amounts of children's Bible things in it. And she used to use them all the time. So, give these kids... <coughs> Pardon me. <clears throat> Have these precious little things, these artwork that the kids do, around, spread around the house. I'm going to share with you one that we still have up in our house. 
This is one that my son Kirby, I don't know if you can read this or not up there. I can't hardly read it. Yeah, you can read it. It says, this is actually put up in our house still. He was probably six at the time when he wrote this, and it was for Mother's Day, uh, so that was a good thing. He said, I love you because you are the greatest mom I ever had. I'm a, I'm a, I even love my sister as much as I love you. I even love my dad as much as I love you. Mom, I want you to know that I love you a whole, whole lot. I love you. I love you almost as much as I love God. You know what? I'm glad God won. But do you think we'll cherish this? You better believe it. This is something that will stay in our house because I'm not going to let it go anywhere. So, are these things silly? Possibly. Are they impactful? Most likely. Are they meaningful? I can tell you highly probable that they will be. Because kids, get your kids involved in your family's faith. One thing that Jan and I did when we were young with our children is we gave them an acronym that was based on our last name that would give them something to remember in times when they came up with temptation. Now, I've got to say, I'm going to give my wife every bit of the credit on this. You, most of you know my last name, our last name is Logan. So my amazing, incredible wife came up with this, leaning on God's almighty name. Wow. That's something they can grab onto, something they can hold on to. We did this back when they were little kids. You know what? And they always know that that's what Logan stands for, is leaning on God's almighty name. Something so simple, but something that they can recall, could recall and still can in a time of decision-making when temptation arise. As I mentioned, the primary verse that I'm going to be using today, again, while many others could, use, is, could be used, is Ephesians 6, 4. So I'm going to ask you, what can we do to take these simple 20 words that God left us and use them to help in raising our chid, kids? First off, I'm going to tell you, parents, that you need to be a source of calmness and support for our children. I'm taking this part where it says, do not provoke. Studies have shown that young adults are more likely to share their parents' religious beliefs and participation if they feel that they have a close, warm, affirming, and supportive relationship with their parents. Moreover, which fascinated me, it was the father, not the mother, who was most instrumental in the quality of these relationships. Young Christians who have faith are far more like, who fall from the faith are far more likely to return if they have a close relationship with their parents. In a verse it says, fathers do not provoke. The word provoke means exasperate. Exasperate means provoke someone to anger, to drive someone to wrath. Well, what provokes kids to rebel against their parents? I don't know, think back. What provoked you as a teenager to rebel against your parents? Was it something that your parents did? Was it hypocrisy? Was it standards that a parent held the child to that they didn't hold themselves to? Whatever it is, the thing is that you should, be, you should not be the reason that your child rebels. Or let me put this another way to you. Your children will most likely end up a whole lot like you. Is that a good thing? If it is, wonderful. But if it isn't, if you have things that you need to work on in your own life, then don't wait until your kids are out of the house. Start working on it now. Because we all know that we need, children need a calm from the storm because it is tough growing up as, a children, as children these days. Sex, the next thing that you need to do is that fathers need, that we need to study the Bible with them. Dads, you need to study the Bible with your children. Really, I'm not just saying that to say it. Even if you know the Bible, that Bible study is important, statistics show that you are probably not doing it. Fewer than one in ten fa Christian families study the Bible together in any given week. If your kids perceive that you've re effectively relegated the Bible to the back burner of relevancy, then why would they have any reason to see it as an authoritative book, that Christian, the, authoritative, the authoritative book that Christians claim it to be. It's absolutely pointless to talk about the Bible being God's word if we're not treating it as such. Meanwhile, 
The Bible is a favorite attack point of skeptics, and our kids will have ample opportunity to hear how it's an ancient book that's irrelevant, it's filled with inaccuracies, and, I, and it is an opportunity to hear how it is not anything that's important. If you are not regularly studying the Bible with your kids, there's a good chance that eventually they will care, stop caring what it has to say. Let's look at some, some possibilities, some other things you can do with your kids. Consider making it a habit to sit down with your family for after, service, after church services for a meal, whether it's at home, whether it's out, out to eat. Talk about what the young ones learned in Bible class. If you have an old, older children, <laughs> they're going to hate this, but ask them about the sermon and what they learned about in the sermon. If they know you're going to be asking that question, I guarantee you that they will start to listen a little bit better. I can say a lot of the things that I learned in seventh grade, I absolutely hated having to memorize. But I can say a whole bunch of the, even the genealogy of Christ at this point in the game. And I'm glad that somebody took the time to make me learn that. What a blessing it was. I remember a speaker on the radio the other day, and I thought this was brilliant. I wish I'd have done it with my kids. He said he used to absolutely hate that his dad did this. He said every time that he was in the car, his dad would ask them math problems, and they had to do it in their head. He said he would ask me what's 8 times 8 times 8 times 8. Now I'm going to tell you, every one of you, within about 10 to 15 seconds, ought to be able to say what the result of that is. Because it's not a hard thing to do if you have studied math. If you can't come up with the point that that's 4,096, you need to go and study a little, your math a little bit better. But he did that. He's thrilled to this day that he actually went through and his dad did that to him. Well, how about doing that with your kids in memorization of Scripture? Why not in the car? Pick a Scripture a week or something for them to be able to learn. Give them that opportunity. Start with teaching your little ones the basic uh, truths that the Bible is God's Word. It's something that you need to go through and make sure that they understand the importance of it. Pick a topic a week like humility, forgiveness, Christ crucified, temptation, whatever is applicable and age appropriate for your children. Go ahead and study it each week. Look at what the Bible says. Have your kids learn how to look up scripture. Have them learn how to use a concordance. Yes, I know all this is online, but there's nothing wrong with a piece of paper that's glued together and has a cover on it, concordance, that they need to can go through and look at how to do things. Teach them how to use topical Bibles. Teach them that the Bible is a source that they can go to. If our children see the importance of God's Word in our lives, I would suggest to you that there is a better opportunity for them to glorify God in their living as you do. Ask yourself, do I want my grandchildren, because that's appropriate for me right now, to be raised in the faith like I raised my kids? I want every one of the current generation and future generations of Logans to be in heaven. Even those ones that I haven't met yet. Lord willing, unless somebody comes, he comes, the good Lord comes back anytime soon, there are going to be other Logans that carry on future down the line. And I want all of them to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And as I mentioned, our grandchildren and, grand, and, children and grandchildren are live, going to live somewhere forever. And unless they make it to heaven, I'm not going to get to meet them. If you haven't started already, start a legacy. A legacy of faith. With your younger children, play Bible story, tell them Bible story games, and then go through and change up the story and have them give you a thumbs up or a thumbs down whether you change the story. Pick things that they learn to do and that they love to do. Another idea, and it's not only a great source, a resource, is, the, uh, is a resource of friendship with other families of like faith and like age kids. What an incredible thing to do, to be able to get together as families and plan things that you can do to teach your children about God's Word. Next thing, parents, you have to be able to continually deepen your own understanding of Christianity. In a secular world, kids will frequently encounter challenges to their faith, especially from vocal atheists. 
Atheists are often prepared to lay out their arguments against God and Christianity. We now have a Supreme Court justice who can't define what a woman is. God did. It's pretty easy to do. Atheists are often well, well prepared to lay out their arguments against God and Christianity in particular. Unfortunately, many Christians are not equally prepared to teach their kids the case for the truth of Christianity and how to defend their beliefs. Questions like the following are critically important when you're going through. Is there evidence for the existence of God? Why would a good God allow evil and suffering? How can a loving God send people to hell? Is faith in God the opposite of reason? What are the historical facts of the resurrection that people agree on? How can Christians believe that miracles are even possible? How do we know the Bible today is one that was actually written? You can go on and on. What are scientific evidences? If you have not looked into the scientific evidences that the Bible is real, you are missing out a lot. God is the author of science. Let's continue. You know, there are a lot of great Christian websites out there, there that you can go to get information from. The first one actually is one of my favorites, and it actually and one of the reasons it's one of my favorites is not only that it has unbelievable information, but actually a member of our body here has a son who's affiliated with its World Video Bible School. There are videos on everything. Where did dinosaurs come from? What about the flood? There's all kinds of, and this, these things are free. They have online Bible study thing that you can do, learning classes. It's incredible. Apologetics Press is another one that is of our, of our, done by Church of Christ people that has outstanding resources. These other ones are not Church of Christ based, but there's a lot of really good resources for getting those and picking up ideas. If you need to find something to do for your kid, go for these. And again, if there's just Google Godly teaching for your kids, you know, ideas to help train my, my kids about the Lord. There are a lot of different websites that you can have. We have to learn that there are big challenges out there, and we have to equip ourselves and our children to engage with them. As I mentioned, there are a lot of those good websites. But one of the things that we have to do is be at home. We have to be able to intentionally make a spiritual space of, through dedication in our home. <coughs> Pardon me. <clears throat> it's not enough to deepen your understanding of your own understanding of Christianity. Somehow you have to transfer that understanding to your kids, and that transfer requires you setting aside time. The kinds of faith conversations that we need to be having with our kids today, like some of the questions I'd asked earlier, are simply not going to happen in a meaningful way if you don't set aside time to sit down and talk to your kids about them. By spiritual space, I mean take 30 minutes a week, set it aside and say, this is our time to ask spiritual questions. Remember, we have to parent with eternity in mind. The last two points of our verse are going to come from the phase, phrase, in the Lord. It's not enough just to raise good kids, although that's what most parents would say these days. I want to raise good kids. We want to raise godly kids. And that means parenting with eternity in mind. Well, what does that mean? It means that oftentimes we are too far, we too far, far too short-sighted in our goals for our kids. What's the American dream? Uh, do, make good grades in school so you can get into a college and get a good job. There's nothing wrong with that. But I want to say it again. Our kids are going to live forever somewhere. And I want that to be in heaven. So point them to Jesus and put as much time into going through and studying their books as you would, as you go in and put as much time into studying the Bible as you would in studying their books. Parents, you also have to ask your tough, tough questions to your kids that your kids do not think to ask. If you regularly encourage your kids to ask questions about faith, you'll have a lot of wonderful conversations. But many of those questions that are important for our kids to understand in preparation for the secular world, they will encounter the ones that may never cross their mind. For example, most kids don't think to ask, how do we know that the Bible is something that was the same thing that was written all those centuries ago? But it doesn't mean that kids won't encounter skeptics 
who will tell them the Bible is completely unworthy for that reason. They'll undoubtedly hear about these topics from skeptics at some point. So there's no reason they shouldn't hear about them, hear about them from you first. I am thrilled to see that there's a Faithful Fathers class that's, that's hopefully going to be starting soon, whenever they are able to get in the building. What an incredible thing. The insights, the sharing of knowledge, and also the building of, each, of Father's faith with each other. Thank you for that. What an incredible class it's going to be coming up. There are a lot of different competings in the mar uh, beliefs in the marketplace. Relativism and skepticism are commonly seen as enlightened positions in our society. Christian parents must train their children in, God, in God's words. Teenagers should be able to walk away from home without falling away from the faith. They must be able to say, as in 1 Peter 3.15, that they should be able to give a reason for the hope that is within them. The fact that so many young people are falling away from their faith should concern every Christian family and every church. It's not enough to blame the secularization of the world on the increased biblical illiteracy that we have in this world, but it is something that the church is partly to blame for because the church should be spreading the word. And I can tell you, if we don't teach our children, and I added grandchildren, to follow Christ, the Lord will teach them not to. That is the way that this world is. And grandparents, your faith and your influence is more than you can ever recognize. You need to be involved with these grandbabies just as well. I can tell you, teaching your kids to count is fine, but teaching them what counts is best. Because I want us all to be able to say, just as Joshua did so many years ago, that as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now, any time that I think I get up here to preach, I think it's important that we ask if there are those that need help. Are there those in this faith that need prayers to the church? If there are, the elders will be at the back. You can come up here. We'll pray with you. Grab anybody. We'll pray with you. Even more so, if you are not in Christ, you need to learn how to get into Christ. We are baptized into Christ. It's been said many, many times, you've heard from a lot of different places, but there are some, several life and death statements in Scripture. Life and death statements about confession, about repentance, about belief, about baptism. If we can help you in any way, please come forward as we stand and sing.